reading up in John chapter 4, verse 46. And I'm using the NASB uh, translation. Therefore, he came again to Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water into wine. And there was a royal official whose son was sick in Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come from Judea into Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then Jesus said to him, Unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply will not believe. The royal official said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, Go, your son is alive. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went home. And as he was now going down, his slaves met him, saying that his son was alive. So he inquired to them of what time, uh, of the hour when he began to get better. They, then they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, which is 1 p.m., uh, the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at that hour in which Jesus said it to him, your son is alive. And he himself believed, and his entire household. This is again a second sign that Jesus performed when he had come from Judea into Galilee. So uh, now talking about this miracle, is there anything in this passage that you can identify with or reminds you of something in your own life, or uh, any way that this miracle applies to you. Sorry, sir. So, so this, um, this miracle is Jesus comes to Cana, which is where he performed the first miracle for the large wine, and a royal official or a nobleman heard that Jesus was coming. So he walked all the way from his town, which was 15 to 20 miles away. So that would take between two and a half to seven hours to walk. Um, and he walked to Jesus and he said, can you please come with me and heal my son? And then Jesus says, unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply will not believe. And he says, please come with me and heal my son. And then Jesus said, go, your son is alive. And then the nobleman goes back to his home, and on his way, his slaves, or his, um, I think it's his slaves, yeah, his slaves, met him on the road and said that his son is better. And then he got better at one o'clock, and that was the same time that Jesus said, your son as well. So then he believes. So my question is, is there any part of this story that reminds you of something in your own life, or something that um, it speaks to you, or you identify with? He doesn't like to fight like, like are you sure? Yeah. Like, so like, like, going to the doctor and asking for medicine. Yeah. Like, oh no, you're good. Yeah. I came here for medicine. Yeah. Granted, you have to walk all the way back for his son, but it feels worth it. Well, your son's dying and they're walk for a few hours. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and yeah, if if he was speed walking, it could have been two hours and forty five minutes. <laughs> According to the person job. Well, you know, you could be you could be sprinting. Yeah, so yeah. that would be even faster. Yeah, exactly. And there is something to even to say that he walked, because if he was a nobleman, he probably would have had like horses. Oh, walk. true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, like, like yeah. he was desperate enough and willing to do no, no well, that. And as a nobleman, would he have been Roman? Probably. Been yeah, a royal, a royal official. So. Okay. 
Um, that sounds like government. Which well, is right, yeah. Right. So that would have been under the Roman government. So not even a Jew. Yeah. 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 Just like the Samaritan woman. Yeah. 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 So something that this miracle kind of that maybe made me think about was like. What is the purpose of miracles? Like, why why are miracles so prevalent in the Bible? And um, like, why? Well, yeah, what is the purpose of miracles? So, I looked I looked in John um, for other places where it mentions miracles. And in John chapter two, twenty three and twenty five, Jesus is performing signs and miracles at uh, Passover in Jerusalem. And it says that he didn't want to stay there because he knew the people there. And I was kind of thinking maybe Jesus knew that his ministry wouldn't be as fruitful if it was in Jerusalem based on who those people were. And if, if they were only believing him just because he was doing signs and wonders, maybe they had a more shallow faith or something like that that Jesus knew. Um, so he ends up leaving Judea. Judea is the south of Israel, that's where Jerusalem is. He leaves Judea and goes uh, north toward Galilee, and he takes that way through Samaria, which uh, Cindy covered. Uh, on the way through Samaria, that's when he sees the woman at the well. And uh, it says that the Galileans accepted him. Um, he was seen as a prophet and they, they had heard about the miracles that he had been doing in Judea. And uh, something that Jesus mentions in that part as well is that, in uh, John chapter 2, is that a prophet isn't honored in his own country. And that the Galileans only welcomed him because of the signs they saw him do in Jerusalem at Passover, because those, those Galileans also went to um, Jerusalem for Passover, because a lot of people do a pilgrimage at that time. Okay. And the words in John chapter 2 kind of echo the same thing that's happening now. Jesus, in this miracle, Jesus says, you won't believe unless I do miracles. Mm -hmm. um, and it kind of sets a tone in both John chapter 2 and John chapter 4 that Jesus is disappointed that people need to see signs and miracles in order to believe, believe his word and believe who he is. Um, but he still does it anyway. He still condescends to our level to, and um, shows, shows us things in ways we can understand, in ways we can see. Um, and yeah, just kind of made me think about how Jesus seeks those who have faith and hope in his words without needing signs and miracles. Um, and so the purpose of biblical miracles seems to point to the authority of the person who performed them or to show a, like a spiritual confirmation that God is working through this person. Um, work, working through that individual uh, so that those who saw the miracles would believe them for what they're saying and believe the God who sent them. Um, and this allowed Jesus and his disciples and apostles to reach multitudes and multitudes of people. And the fact that they did miracles established a church in history. To the point where today, millions of people worldwide have heard about Jesus, believe in Jesus, follow after him, and choose to share the gospel with others. And uh, that's kind of what I was thinking. And um, and then on a more, uh, on another note of what the miracle kind of spoke to me, is talking, it, I felt like it kind of speaking to me about my own faith. I kind of was thinking like, do I have the faith to go walk seven hours for, for anything? <laughs> um, you know, or, you know, run, run for three hours, like, and... He expects Jesus to do one of two things. He expects Jesus to either send him away, like, no, you're silly, I'm not healing your son. Um, you're, you're a different uh, culture than I am. No, I'm not healing you. Or 
He thought Jesus would go with him. He thought Jesus would travel with him, lay hands on his son, and heal him. And I thought it was funny that Jesus didn't do either of his expectations. Jesus simply speaks. And he surpasses all of the nobleman's expectations, healing his son in that very moment. And it was such a, an amazing moment for that woman and his family that all of them believed in Jesus and who he was. It says the whole household believed. Um, and that just kind of spoke to me too, because in my own life, I have expectations of how I think God is going to move, how I think he'll deal with the situation, and... And reading this verse just reminded me how much bigger God is than my expectations and how much bigger God is than any of my problems. Um, and then so that kind of made me think about, because I was thinking about my faith with all that, I was also thinking about prayer and my own will in prayer. Like, what is the right thing to pray for? Because uh, John 1, or 1 John, sorry, 5, 14 came to mind, and that's the verse that says, This is the confidence we have in approaching, in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And then I also thought about Matthew 6, 9, and 13, which is the Lord's Prayer. It says, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And... Luke 22, 42 says, this is um, Jesus speaking, uh, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. So this idea of miracles, and this idea of my faith, I felt like this verse, or this uh, passage of scripture was kind of just speaking to my heart about praying that God's will is done in my life and praying that my will aligns with what God's will is. Um, and I, I heard that a lot growing up, like, oh, um, uh, the Lord's Prayer, um, your will be done on earth is in, is in heaven, and praying that uh, when Jesus says that how he prays that Christians and um, believers are one, just as he and the Father are one, and um, that unity and that that unity over a same will. I was just kind of thinking about that. And it, uh, it's kind of a vague thing to say, to pray that my will becomes God's will. Or that I, you know, am transformed into God's image. Because that's, that's the prayer that I do kind of often. I pray that God transforms me into his image. And that, that uh, I am who he has called me to be. And I've kind of heard from friends and heard from family who are going through troubles or going through transitionary periods in their life. And they say things like, I just, I don't know if it's God's will that I take this job. Or I don't know if it's God's will that I stay in this relationship. Or, or I don't know if it's God's will that I break up in this relationship. Or I don't know if it's God's will that I move to this place. And they're taking really specific choices in their life. And they're saying, what is God's will in that choice? And kind of like a caricature of that is like, what would Jesus do? Mm -hmm. um, but would Jesus accept a job as a car salesman? Would Jesus be a politician? Would Jesus be a custodian? Would Jesus be a celebrity? Would Jesus be a doctor? Would he be a pharmacist? Would he be a receptionist? Would he be a nurse? Or a high school teacher? Or a web developer? Would he move to Winnipeg? Or would he stay in Regina? Or would he move to Alberta or Germany? Uh, would he stay in a relationship or would he break it off? Would he get married and settle down or would he stay single? Would he have kids? Would he have hobbies or would he work nonstop? All of, the, all of these questions are obviously rhetorical because we know that Jesus was a carpenter by trade. We know that he didn't get married, that he didn't run for office, and that he didn't have children, and he didn't move to British Columbia. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing is, when you say, what would Jesus do, is you aren't Jesus. I'm not Jesus. We're not Jesus. 
So to say that, what would Jesus do in these scenarios is kind of a vague, I think it's kind of mixing things up a little bit. Because God has a unique call in all of our lives. Um, all of us, he has placed uh, a call on our life to, to rise to. And sometimes it's hard to know what that is. Sometimes it takes searching. Um, because God doesn't always speak audibly. Like you can hear his voice in a scenario. He doesn't always make a decision clear for us. But I think God has blessed us with the ability to choose. That we have the ability to be who we are and to decide what we do. That we can make plans and carry them out. He, uh, he's given us the ability to decide how we treat others, how we treat our families, how we treat ourselves, and how to treat those who hate us. Um, Proverbs 16.9 says that the mind of a person plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. So I think it's important to also remember back in Genesis, in Genesis 1, when God is creating humankind, he said that he, creates, he created us in his image and that we are to be stewards of his creation, to take care of the earth, to fill the earth and subdue it, to rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and over every living creature on the ground. So we are, we are God's noblemen here on earth. We're his royal ambassadors to the earth, to be his representatives and to govern and to rule over the earth that he created for us. Um, so we are to be that light on the hill, to be the salt in the earth. So instead of telling you like specific things like, oh, you should do this job, or oh, you should break that, or those things, we can still look to the Bible for answers and how, how we can live our lives and what kind of choices are the right choices to make. Um, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, 18 says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. And Micah 6, 8 says, he has shown you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Uh, Colossians 3, 12, 17 says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another, if any of you have, has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with the wisdom, with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So God calls us to partner with him whoever we are in life, whatever our occupation or job, no matter how we've been treated in our past, no matter the mistakes we've made. He accepts us all as we are. Because he lived the perfect life that we never could. He broke his body for us, and he shed his blood to cleanse us from our sins. By dying on the cross and bearing our punishment on our behalf. Um, so at this point, I would like to do communion to remember that Jesus' body was broken for us and his blood was shed so that we can enter into, um, back into the covenant that we had broken. Okay, so I'll just read it one more time. Just the... That he took the bread when he had given thanks and broke it and said, This is my body which is for you.
Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. that Jesus welcomes us into. And uh, if you're wanting to read more on that, you can read Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, James chapter 2, 1 John chapter 1, and Ephesians 2, 1 and 10. Uh, and that is everything that I have for my study. Well, what was the verse you had before?